partner before any bank would approve a loan. The only difference in this presentation to the banks before and after the loan approval was the presence of his white equity partner. The critical variable was not the financial strength of, the pres of his presentation because he had a wealthy black football player that was willing to act as a credit backer, but still the bank rejected his loan application. Only when the white credit backer was presented did the banks approve, so the issue had to be the credit backer's race. His, his was an eight-year-old eight business with 45 employees, generating 25% annual growth during a recession with 10 to $15 million in sales and a, an 800 to $1 million in annual profits. He had three times the cash flow needed to cover debt service on three new plants, but still he could not get a loan for a single new plant until he had the white equity backer. In spite of this credit worthiness, Today, he faced, he faced the same challenges that a startup business would face. No matter how strong the business was, the secondary source for repayment that his, his approval was, his, his loan application was disapproved um, <clears throat> by the banks. In another instance, an, an African-American contractor in Richmond, Virginia faced a disparate, disparate treatment in his competition for construction, demolition, and disposal contracts. After his bid for a city demolition contract was determined to be the lowest, the contract was in fact split in half, resulting in a majority contractor receiving a portion of the contract in as well. In other cases where he was the lowest bidder and the contract award was, he was the lowest bidder and the contract award was in fact split. Uh, I have many other anecdotes. Um, Madam Chairwoman, I see my time has, has elapsed. Uh, and <clears throat> again, we would like to submit the balance of the 65 testimonies into the record. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Madam Chairman, members of the committee, we definitely appreciate the opportunity uh, for us to share information and basically seek your support. From the previous distinguished panel, I think it would be helpful uh, because if you listen, as I listen as a businessman and as an advocate for the community, uh, that panel basically more or less gave me the impression that everything is just great and fine. However, there was no mention of all the many, many small minority businesses and small businesses that disappeared from the federal sector over the last 20 years. Uh, there's no mention of how many of those businesses, the only way to get out is to be acquired. And in that process, for example, the, uh, I would like for the panel to ask the previous members how many of the awards they claim has gone to small business as the, there's been a GAO study and an SBA study that shows that agencies are reporting awards that have gone to large companies as small business awards. Also, when companies, small business get acquired, for example, the, the, there's recent acquisition of a company uh, they had almost uh, $200 million worth of business that used to be a small business. A good portion of that portfolio were small business awards, and yet the big company now has the contracts, but yet are being accounted as small business. Also, as it relates to the Department of Defense, it would be important to ask them, you know, why is it that on the NetSense Air Force contract, where originally we had a small business set-aside program, <laughs> the Air Force eliminated the small business set-aside program. And what is it that the many DOD, particularly the Army, allows for direct competition, they call it small business set-asides, but yet the small business community and the minority business community has to compete against the large companies. Basically, also, SBA uh, representative talked about c coming up with a new study on size standards. And Madam Chairman, uh, both Congress and the SBA has been studying size standards now for 30 <coughs> years and still we're in the same place that we were 30 years ago. My written testimony that's been submitted uh, to the committee has been reviewed by the Minority Roundtable um, Organization, <coughs> by Tony's organization, by the LAMA organization, the Latin American Management Association and also, of course, by the organization that we represent here today is MTA. The minority and small business community has made a significant contributions to our nation, both in the uh, federal agencies, to its employees, 
and to the community. However, there is indeed, and I'd like to focus my limited time, to a specific issue that is important that all of us focus on, and that is the inability for small business and minority business to really com uh, compete due to the faulty policy on size standards. Basically, uh, Madam Chairman, it comes to a very uh, simple question. If you take, for example, the training company, the size standards of a training company is $7 million. For a facility management company is $25 million. Now, how can a, if, when a, when a training company uh, graduates from the $7 million size standard, how can a $7 million company compete against a $29 billion company? If you take the last, if you take the five top integrators, uh, their average sales are $29 billion. Now, even if you multiply the size standards that are now in the books by four times, you still have to ask how can a, how can a $28 million company, if you take the $7 million size standard on training and you multiply by four, how can a $28 million company compete against a $29 billion organization? The same thing on IT. How can uh, the size standard for IT is 25 million? Multiply that times four, be generous. And how can a $100 million company compete against a $29, million, $29 billion firm? Now, bas basically, the large organizations, <coughs> uh, Northrop Grumman is $33 billion. And really, when it comes down to Madam Chairman, over the years, we keep talking about mid-sized firms. And the reality is, uh, Madam Chairman, is the mid-sized firms are really not the uh, classical small businesses that have grown over the size standard, okay? But it has been organizations like um, Booz Allen, Kaki, three, Point one billion, Wiley one billion, Unisys four billion. Those firms themselves, if you look at their last ten years records of growth, most of the growth has been through acquisition. So if those firms have a difficulty in competing, how in the devil can we expect for the small business community that has grown out of the size standard to be able to survive? It is impossible. The one thing, unfortunately, I'm going to share with you, Madam Chairman, that when I've had discussions with members of um, uh, elected members in the House and the Senate, and we ask them, how does a small business, where do they pay for their business development and proposal development? And quite frankly, it is sad for me over the years to find out that those members did not know the answer. In order for a government contract, there's a big difference between dealing with the private sector and the federal government. Big difference. And the way that a company can grow is how much GNA can you build into your budget. And the only way you can have an increased budget in order to be able to afford to be competitive, you have to have higher level of sales. But then if you become somewhat over the size standard, it really it becomes imp impossible, and that's the reason you have so many casualties. So the basic solution, there is a solution, and that is to develop a tier effect of competition by the number of employees. We appreciate the opportunity, Madam Chairman, to provide our testimony. Madam Chairwoman, members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me here today. My name is Don O'Bannon, and I am chair of the Airport Minority Advisory Council, AMAC. AMAC is the only national nonprofit organization dedicated to creating success for minorities and women in the airport industry. While AMAC's primary focus is on airport-related business, AMAC members work on contracts funded by, by many different federal agencies. AMAC is a strong advocate for federal policies, like the DBE program that address discrimination in government contracting. As this subcommittee has heard and is well aware, Racial and gender discrimination against minority and women business owners continues to be an ongoing problem. 
Minority women business owners experience discrimination in all aspects of public contracting. But DBE type programs do more than address discrimination. The DBE program is a significant source of the entrepreneurship, employment, and economic growth of the minority and women-owned business community. Minority and women-owned firms, when given a fair chance and a level playing field, are important engines of growth in our economy. Fortunately, various federal, state, and local programs aimed at giving every entrepreneur a full and fair opportunity to succeed have begun to make some headway. Nevertheless, discrimination against minority and women-owned businesses continues to be persistent and pervasive. The evidence is compelling that the discrimination remains a problem and that programs like the DBE program are vital to, to address that discrimination. Testimonial from AMAC members detail the discrimination they have had to endure. These personal stories make it clear how difficult it is to run a business while enduring discrimination. To make matters worse, business owners are often fearful about reporting the, the discrimination. For this reason, we will report AMAX members' experience without using their names. A female construction contractor reported aggressive sex discrimination. She has also repeatedly experienced harmful gender, gender discrimination in supply pricing, bid shopping, and access to capital. One minority business expert has observed discrimination including intimidation and retaliation against minority contractors, disproportionate punishment of minority contractors for minor infractions, and racially discriminatory remarks. A female Hispanic business owner developed a new airport concessions build business. Her majority-owned leasing company launched a whisper campaign intended to undermine her success and the retail lease by falsely claiming that she was not dedicated to her business and instead was focusing on being a mommy. An African-American business owner endured many instances of racial discrimination, including being charged 50% more for certain supplies and being subject to racial slurs. The story of an African-American airport executive il illustrates just how resistant majority primes can be to change. This executive were working to help identify business owners for concessions opportunities at Memphis Airport, but the prime was simply not committed to participation. The prime claimed that he could not find any qualified owners to open a barbecue restaurant at the airport in Memphis, Tennessee. As our member said, I kid you not, this man looked at me in the face and told me he could not find a minority business that cooked barbecue in Memphis. <laughs> With our testimony today, AMAC is submitting 24 disparity studies. We ask that these studies be included in the record. Madam Chair, may we offer these studies into the record? Yes, without through, objection. Through both quantitative and qualitative evidence, statistically they demonstrate the existence of serious discrimination against women and minorities in many different industries across the nation. Each of the disparity studies provides significant quantitative evidence of discrimination against minority and women-owned businesses in both the public and private sector. In addition, the studies include numerous individual reports of discriminatory behavior similar to the examples I have given you from AMAC's membership. The accounts make it clear that minority and women entrepreneurs are subject to a broad range of discriminatory actions including discrimination in lending and supply purchasing. They also reveal the use of racial slurs and other tactics aimed at intimidating minority and women-owned business owners. Overall, these studies provide strong evidence of serious discrimination against minority, uh, minorities and women. They also demonstrate that there is a compelling and continuing need for the DBE program and similar programs across the federal contracting front dealing with public funds. For these same reasons, AMAC strongly supports final enactment of the FAA reauthorization bill and the improvements to the DBE program it contains. These changes are precisely the policy changes needed to ensure that the aviation system here in America remains the best in the world. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Singer. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. <coughs> and, uh,
Ranking Member Bilbray, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Joel Zingasser. I'm with Grunley Construction <coughs> of Rockville, Maryland. I come to you today on behalf of the Associated General Contractors of America. AGC strongly supports full and open competition for the many contracts necessary to construct improvements to real property. <coughs> AGC supports procurement reform to improve delivery of federal construction services. Reform of the federal procurement process should recognize construction's unique melding of industry sectors while ensuring the government is using the most cost-effective method for procurement. AGC would like to discuss an issue of great concern to us <clears throat> that we believe, if addressed, will bring the greatest possible amount of transparency to federal contracting and specifically contracting with small and disadvantaged business, uh, businesses nationwide. Current SBA rules require that small business set-asides and established small business goals uh, be met by large businesses to assure that significant portions of federal procurement dollars flow to small business firms. But the rules for keeping track and measuring the flow of dollars to small businesses do not take into account the actual amounts that flow down to small businesses below the first tier level of subcontracting. As you already heard today from others, the nature of the construction industry and how it operates is through subcontractors and second and third tier subcontractors. Within the construction industry, the bulk of the work is performed by subcontractors that specialize in specific expertise and in turn hire second and third tier firms to perform elements of the project. Under the current system, if an other than small business is included as a first tier subcontractor, the prime contractor is not, at, not asked to report the flow of dollars that are going to small businesses hired below the first tier subcontract. This <clears throat> is because the contracting agency, those federal agencies that are awarding the, the uh, procurements, are not allowed to take credit for those dollars towards their goals. Allowing prime contractors to report small business subcontracting at all tiers would demonstrate true participation of small businesses on federal contract and would show more accurately how significantly the, con the construction industry supports and is in fact dependent upon small businesses. In attempting to meet the various small business goals under the current system, Prime contractors are often required to consider subcontractor choices for large projects that are beyond the capacity, especially bonding capacity, of small businesses. The present approach to keeping score puts pressure on small businesses to accept roles with larger firms operating <clears throat> under them in a way that is upside down, in an unnatural alignment. If credit for small business participation were allowed to be counted toward the goals <clears throat> when the small businesses are performing in their logical and most comfortable roles, the true benefits of small business <clears throat> to the construction industry will be measured, accounted for, and recognized for what they are, critical to the su success of our industry. Moreover, such a system would allow small and emerging firms to grow in a natural manner that will force them to become, not to become overextended and ultimately this will make them more successful. Changing the scoring system will let prime contractors and small businesses determine together the best arrangement of large and small subcontractors according to capabilities, capacity, and availability. The ability to solve the reporting problem is available today. The shift to the Electronic Subcontractor Reporting System, or ESARS, by the federal government provides the opportunity to simply and accurately gather the small business data at all tiers and thus correct the problem. The system has the capability to track and report small business subcontractors on multiple tiers, yet current rules do not encourage prime contractors and their subcontractors to account for total small business participation at all tiers. The Interagency Task Force on Federal Contracting Opportunities for Small Business recommends enhancing the uh, electronic subcontractor reporting system. Specif specifically, the task force recommends enhancing <clears throat> the ESARs to better capture subcontracting at all tiers. <clears throat> 
AGC recommends Congress direct a change to the system by amending the Federal uh, Acquisition Regulations, or the FAR, through legislation to allow all parties to report and receive credit for the dollars flowing to all small businesses on Federal contracts. We have attached suggestions. The opportunity to look forward to working with the, ch the Chairwoman um, and uh, hopefully with the, the blessing of the voters, I will be around to uh, work with whoever um, the uh, Democratic leadership uh, chooses to work with me on this committee. But I think that there are some great opportunities here so when we get in there. And all I got to say one thing about the budget process, you think it's tough now. <laughs> Believe me, it's going to get very, very ugly. I mean, con the, the Congressman from Virginia talked about a 10 percent cut across for the, the uh, Department of Defense for contracts. I think we see some real tough times coming down the pike. and. Um, Believe me, when all of us go back to the district, they're really looking at us. And, and coming from this committee, we get a lot of scrutiny. So I, I appreciate your testimony. And, and uh, Madam Chair, I really uh, appreciate the fact that um, you've um, jumped into this. And I know you have some questions. Thank you so much. And let me quickly just go down the line of panelists. I'd like to start with you, Mr. Robinson, and uh, you're in the business of providing the legal defense and so on. Uh, in your opinion, uh, how do minority-owned firms tend to view the various types of federal assistance provided to them, and are some programs perceived as being more or less effective in offering assistance? <clears throat> um. Madam Chairwoman, um, <laughs> that's a very mixed bag. Um, just there are, there are Mr. Bilbrey, I think, suggested when we make a mistake, perhaps we can correct it. If we properly account and let these businesses, whether they be minority or other specially uh, characterized businesses, if we allow the businesses to operate at the level they want to operate at, the trade they provide, the service they provide, in the alignment, and we get the credit, Everybody gets the credit. We'll see what we're doing. They'll grow. They'll be more comfortable. They'll do the things that the program is intended to do, not create some opportunity for others, uh, other business models. So I'm, as you can tell, pretty passionate about this. I think we have the answers to some part of it. It's an exactly. incremental problem. We can't solve all of the history of our country through some of these things, but we can do some things that will make a better environment for these programs to succeed. That's what we're, we're trying to suggest. I appreciate your testimony. And uh, finally, um, Mr. Sumner, in your testimony, you cite the decrease in federal contract awards given through Caltrans uh, to disadvantaged business enterprises from 28%, uh, that was 1994, to just 2% 2 in 2008. How much of an impact has the federal government had in increasing contracting opportunities for minority-owned businesses? Um, specifically from the federal government, um, the DBE program that was required, um, because it's a U.S. DOT requirement if you receive federal awards, um, I think was beneficial in the state of California because it continued some form of the DBE program. Um, the, although we weren't able to collect evidence on that ourselves, the Caltrans Availability and Disparity Study showed the level of disparity to be two to three times higher for state awards, which is um, where the program wasn't operating. Um, and on top of that, some of the things that were part of the federal um, program would be things like mentorship opportunities, technical assistance opportunities, that would have a spillover effect on state awards. So it's possible that without the federal program, the uh, state program might have shown even more disparity. Um, so the federal government's DBE program um, has been a benefit, I think, in California. And given the influx of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act funds to California, are you aware of an increase in opportunities for minority-owned businesses? Um, obviously, there's a, the potential of opportunities there since it was a, a large